had decades long experience of uh, researching and writing about citizenship in Africa, uh, often at the behest of uh, international organizations, for example, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner uh, for Refugees and uh, significant civil society donors and actors, for example, the Open Society Institute. Can you just uh, briefly tell us about your experiences with research? Uh, what major observations did you make and how are issues of state succession handled in Africa and what can and should be done in relation to access to citizenship for refugees? Wow, three big questions there. Uh, so first of all, around research. I mean, my first real experience with research was working for Human Rights Watch. So I spent quite uh, 11 years altogether working for Human Rights Watch, doing research in different countries, especially South Africa, which is where my family origins are, and uh, Nigeria. I uh, did a lot of work around the oil industry. Uh, but in relation to nationality and citizenship, uh, that I started doing that work with the Open Society Foundations. Uh, and it was, it was over the course of many years in which a lot of it was actually going to meetings and being involved in discussions and uh, engaging with work that African scholars had done as well. Uh, and then trying to pull this into, into one place. For uh, UNHCR, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, I've done a lot of research, a series of reports about statelessness in different African regions. So West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa. I'm currently working on a report on the Horn of Africa. And what I observe in that is the, the challenge of researching statelessness and, the, and access to nationality is for so many people, for the vast majority of people in all states, including in African states, it just seems to be obvious. Well, obviously I'm a Zimbabwean, obviously I'm Congolese, obviously I'm Ethiopian. And if you are a member of you know, a majority ethnic group and your parents were married and your birth was registered and you live in the same region as where you know as both your parents and everybody knows you, then it is, even if you even if you don't have documents, it probably is obvious that you are. The nationality you believe yourself to be but if your father was foreign and your and is now dead and your birth was never registered and you've been displaced by war or you belong to an ethnic group that's got a border going through the middle of it uh, or you are the child uh, who, who you know an orphan and you don't know who your parents are I mean it suddenly becomes not at all obvious and in particular it's not obvious to the authorities of the state administrative apparatus that is in, in charge of issuing national identity cards or passports or voter registration. And so at that point, you may believe yourself to be a citizen and not to be a citizen anywhere else, but proving it becomes a big challenge. And the challenge of proof is becoming more and more important because we're, you know, whereas 30, 40 years ago, it was totally possible to live in many countries, including in European countries, without an identity document. It's becoming much, much, much more difficult to do that. And there's a big push to improve identity documents in Africa, such that even though many people still don't have documents, it's becoming more and more difficult to exist without a document. So to come back to the question about research, the where do you go to find the people who can't prove citizenship? Well, you go to the children's homes and say, which children have a, you know, when they turn 16 or 18, can't get a national identity card. You go to the human rights institutions, obviously, you go to the women's rights groups and say, is there gender discrimination? Even if it's been taken away in the law, what happens if the father is foreign? Do you see children who are facing difficulties because the father is said to be foreign and therefore the child is not believed to be a citizen? And how does the law and the practice match up? So it's, it's going to find the groups uh, that, that find themselves excluded. The groups that exist in border areas and are constantly, both countries say, no, 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 you belong to the other one. And how do they prove which one they belong to? So finding the representatives of those groups. Um, and that question about border areas uh, brings me to your second question, which was about state succession. So state succession is a term in international law, which means when the sovereignty of a territory is transferred from one authority to another. And the biggest cases in Africa are the transfer of sovereignty from the colonial powers to the newly independent states. And then of course, there've been a couple of much more recent state successions of South Sudan and of Eritrea as well. But largely we're talking about the transition from colonial era 
to the independent states. And there we see that while the colonial authorities freely moved people around to work on plantations, if not absolutely forced labor, coerced by hut taxes and similar questions, uh, or people you know, moved about because they were following economic opportunities. And you have very large numbers of people who, while they were born in the country, and maybe their parents were also born in the country, their historical origins come from somewhere else. And at independence, their incorporation into the citizen body of the new states was not at all guaranteed. And the populations we're talking about here are, of course, well, partly people of white European descent, but in almost all cases, they were welcomed back to their, the metropolitan countries, but they could face difficulties. People of mixed race, so the children of white fathers who face discrimination because they were believed, you know, they seemed to be European, but the Europeans didn't want them. People of Asian descent, people of Lebanese or Middle Eastern descent, all of those, but actually much more importantly, people of other African descent. Um, so if one looks in Zimbabwe, people of Zambian, Mozambique and Malawian descent who'd been brought in to work on farms and mines. In Cote d'Ivoire, people from uh, Burkina Faso especially, but also Mali, Guinea, working on cocoa and coffee plantations. In Congo, people of Burundian and uh, Rwandan descent working on plantations in Eastern Congo. And so the status of these populations is, you know, has remained you know, a key point of conflict in a number of African countries. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, how was their status resolved on state succession and how are they incorporated into the body since then has remained a, a critical political problem in, in many African countries. And it